Real quick before the episode starts, I want to say the time is now. We want your sprues, but only one to three sprues, please. I don't want you to send a garbage bag full of sprues. You can sign them however you want. The address will be in the description below. And after a set amount of time, I'm going to remove the address just so I'm not getting sent, you know, trashed like a month down the road. But yes, send us one to three sprues. Address in the description. Looking forward to filling out our sign with your trash, I guess. <laughs> All right, now we'll continue with your regularly scheduled top. And on the 13th day, the spaghetti meatball monster in the sky created the podcast known as... Trapped Under Plastic. <sighs> Trapped Under Plastic, the miniature painting podcast that makes Mondays objectively better than Fridays. Take that, Kenny Boucher. The literal best of all days. <laughs> John, how you doing? I'm doing wonderful-tacular. How are you doing? I'm doing good, too. See, I was funny. I was driving up here this morning, and I was like, you know, we never do. We never start off by saying, how's it going, bro? Yeah. We never do that. We're getting back to basics today, because this is not a written episode or a research episode. There's no guests. It's just me and John in a basement right now. Yeah, this is as pleb version of the podcast <laughs> as there will ever be. Yes. This is back to the roots, this right? Is, this is the roots. The roots is no prep. Yeah. The roots is... Last night at 9 p.m., you messaged me, can you quick write the ad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our sponsors have to uh, go through a lot, so make sure to go buy from them, please. Because <laughs> they have to deal with us. Uh, the first item in the preamble ramble here is, what day is it? What day is it? I'm not okay. sure if I can help you with that. It, it's Friday. Uh, okay. December Thank 3rd. You. Thank you. That was literally just a question. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on. No. Okay. Um, so, I remember for the longest time uh, on occasion, you would tell me, We'd be talking about something, and you're like, oh, yeah, 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 it is Thursday, isn't it? You'd mention things like you, you lose track of what day it is. Yes. And I always thought that was really freaking weird. Oh, okay. And now that I'm doing this full time, I feel that almost every single day. Yeah, I don't dude. know what day it is. Days flow into they, days. It's just a blur. Yeah. Um, the only thing that grounds me is knowing that I need to take my daughter to school. <laughs> do I have to do that? I don't know. And then around Thanksgiving holiday, that threw it all even more for a loop because she yeah. was home some days, other days, not home. I don't know. Yeah. But <clears throat> why I wanted to bring this up, because when when you told me that, I would be like, in my head, I'd be like, oh, it must be nice, dude. This is like every day. You're, you you think to like best case scenario, you're like, oh, that means like every day is a Friday or every day is a Saturday, sure, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> every day is a Monday. Yeah. Every day is, <laughs> I, there's stuff to do. My yeah. brain is worrying on things yep. that I need to get done. And all the other things in addition to cranking out videos and painting minis, um, you got to find time to do those too. So, and I don't... I'm not doing this to ask for your pity. I'm just, I'm just oh, kind of stating like from uh, owning your own business and knowing like you wake up in the morning, you're like, if I don't get shit done, nothing gets done in this business. Yeah. I, I relate so hard to what you just said. You're not asking for pity. You're, it's just, you just, it's just fun to open the curtain a little bit to kind yeah. of just express what's going on. Yeah. We don't necessarily need people feeling bad for us. No, yeah. don't feel bad for us. Yeah, definitely don't. We have no. the best job in the world. We do. We really do. But yeah, uh, this Sunday I have to I have to be in the office like all day long while uh, a contractor who's local and a fan of the channel is going to come in and help me sort out all my audio and HDMI issues and Ethernet cables and oh, running that stuff. Dude's cable dude. Yeah, yeah. Cable guy. Cable guys there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But yeah, I, t I totally get it. Like, there's always things to do. Like, you work in evening sometimes. Even if it's just answering emails, like it's always a little tasks to do and they can take up hours yeah yep and, and and i don't the weird thing is is like you know like i said we were i was doing stuff for the podcast last night i was answering emails last night i was going through some patreon stuff and, and chatting some folks there last night and i'm not like oh i gotta do this it's more of like it's 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 fun it's not it's not unfun most of it like it's i had a empowering. sponsor oh 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 get this though i had yeah. a sponsor for one of my videos that told I had a sponsorship scheduled. I've got a contract with them. I can see the company, but for X number of, of videos, they sent me an email yesterday saying, you have a video scheduled for December 24th. Um, we are requesting that you have it out by December 19th at the latest. And I'm like, for review, for, for review. No, no, no. F your video has to be published oh. by the 19th because they don't want, videos closer to christmas right and i said bitch you listen here 
I am scheduled out with sponsorship till March 2022. All of my videos are, are previously scheduled for when they're going to go and have a sponsor. There's no room for you. Yes. You take this spot. All right, rip up the goddamn contract. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to deal with that. Yeah, I was just like, that. those kinds of things are frustrating. You're like, I'm just trying to keep the train rolling. I'm yeah. trying to have fun. I'm yeah. having fun. I don't need... This thing where I signed a paper, you signed a paper, and this is what we agreed to. And those dates were all in that contract. I checked it for I emailed her back. And she's like, okay, I'll make an exception. I'm like, damn right, you make an exception. <laughs> yeah. That definitely can that can that, that can be a little soul sucking at times. I think what I don't like about sponsorships and why I don't want to schedule them anymore is because if you have like a month where you want to do something that's like not necessarily video making, like cleaning that closet. Yeah. Like, that Setting was, that was necessary. Whole... Yeah, yeah. Or the office and all that stuff. I can't, I don't want to have to worry about making videos in that month while I'm also doing all that shit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's not easy sometimes. And it's also a lot of, uh, okay, this is also going back behind the curtain. Dealing with companies in the miniature realm, are super cool. They're super great to deal with. I've yeah. not worked with a single sponsor that makes something for our hobby. That's not been just awesome. The, these general ones, are where usually where the problems lie. And, uh, well, you know, not to shit on Raid Shadow Legends, but I'm just going to use them as an example. What they do is they contact you. I, I had one yesterday from Raid Shadow Legends. It's December 3rd. We would like to sponsor a video in the month of December. And I'm like, what? No. I, I, we'd just be like, ha, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to just throw a video out to you in the next three weeks. Well, just say no to them. I, oh, I do. I don't, okay. I, I don't do, and there's a ton of them that's just like, it, whether I want to or not, yeah, yeah, I'll do people, it for you. I can't do it because well, yeah. what's your turnaround time is ridiculous. Welcome like, to December. Yeah, this is. I mean, that happens to me almost every month. I yeah, get people that that have a less than one month turnaround time on an ad spot. It's just like, I'm sorry, this yeah. is that's. Well, I don't know what world you live in where that's how business is done, but I guess they come from, um, come from the medical industry where like everything is planned, everything is science based, everything is vetted through three different you know, groups to make sure, you know, so everything is really held. Every decision that's a big decision is brought with a lot of weight. Um, but, you know, I guess from the marketing and the, in the, you know, pushing product standpoint, it's quick, quick, quick. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's move on from this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you, do you have anything to talk about? The I do. Room? I went home to visit my parents for Thanksgiving. My mom is a huge, just a huge geek. Um, but also, she's a huge geek of sci-fi. She reads a lot of Isaac Asimov books. Oh, man. There, there's some there, heavy duty stuff there. Yeah, and she was reading, uh, her and my dad were reading uh, Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton when I was there. Um, but she loves Dune, and I was trying to convince her to watch the Dune movie. She's not a big fan of Timothy Chalamet. Uh, she thinks that Paul Atreides is, is more of like a, a physically built like warrior person than Paul, than uh, Timothy is kind of more like a thin, thin kind of frail guy. And she doesn't like how he acts. So she's like, I don't want to see it. And it's like, you should see it. It's awesome. And she was asking me all these questions about, is this, is this part in it? Is this part in it? And then she asked me about this thing called the Navigators. And there are, are Navigators, and you probably know this because you read the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, they are drugged up on spice, and they commune with like space in a way where they're folding it so they can travel through space and time fast. Not time, just space, sorry. Mm -hmm. Like almost like making the jump to warp. Mm -hmm. And the way she described them as like being drugged up, like almost doing a kind of magic to... Uh, travel through space and them being called navigators reminded me so much of navigators in 40 K. They're okay. the same thing. they are a unique species. Uh, they have like an eye on their forehead and, and like that. eye, I don't know. It does special things for them, but really they're able to like travel like a giant spaceship through space in a way that no other species can do it. Like they need to go to a planet to find a navigator to actually fly a ship. And if you kill that one person, you're, you're fucked. You can't, <laughs> you can't travel through space in, in the same way anymore through the warp or whatever it is. But it, it was just so similar to a navigator in 40 K. Huh? I wonder where, I uh, wonder where 40 K got that idea. from. <laughs> I mean, 40 K has been around for a while. So has Dune. I don't know what came first, but it is uncanny how similar they were. Dune was, the original Dune was written in like 1959. Okay, so, I think that wins. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I think it definitely wins. <laughs> I think that's probably um, there's there's a lot of that in the in the 40k universe. Yeah, a lot of sharing, a lot, a lot of a lot, a lot of, of stuff folded in. We'll, uh, we'll use the yeah. massaging term. It's yeah, yeah. folded in. Yeah, which is fine. Like dude, so much of these ideas, and that's one other thing about like 
talking about IP and, and you know, you're, you're ripping off stuff from GW. So much stuff from the fantasy and science fiction realms are, are like houses built on prior civilizations. Yeah. And you take this collective understanding, this collective made up history and knowledge, and you're building upon it and your own interesting take on it, your own version of it. So it's kind of weird. And it's not just with this. It's, it's also with things like Star Wars and everything where it's like, you can't do that. You can't use lightsabers. That's stealing our idea. But you know, yours, your idea was built on somebody else's ideas and right. it was a tweak as well. And there are some points where it gets very specific. I totally understand. You can't just like name a little green, you know, mentor Yoba and be like, <laughs> <laughs> Master Yoba. <laughs> Oh, that's a really freaking cool idea. Yeah, that's like the discount Yoda. He's like drunk all the time. He's just a real shitty Jedi. Yoba. On mushrooms, Master Yoba is. <laughs> Seeing <and> smells. <laughs> Coming 2022, Master Yoba trapped under plastic merch. It's a fucking lightsaber. It's like a giant joint. Or it's like some fucking bong or something. It's just like extendo bong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'd be amazing. I wonder how long till George Lucas would sue us for Master Yoba shirts. <laughs> All right, you have another thing. Why don't we have our Tendy shirts? Bro, we got the Tendies Destroyer of Tendies Goody PP shirts. And I'm seeing them out in the wild. I'm seeing we can't even chill them ourselves. People posting awesome pictures of these shirts on our Facebook group and everything. We don't have them because okay. Scott decided he would just send an email. No, I filled out a form that no one watches. <laughs> <laughs> dude, look at that fucking snot bubble. Uh, dude, I got a snot. Uh, oh, God damn it, John. Dude, can you see that? <laughs> Clean um, that up. Oh, to see how far back I can pull it. Oh, God. That was like at least three inches. <laughs> All right, that's the record. All right, for the audio listeners, uh, I laughed and snot came out my nose and stuck to the microphone and it created this like Spider-Man-esque web. And oh. I pulled my... It, 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 okay. Um, Kill me, dude. So you sent out a form that doesn't exist into the internet and uh, no one answered it and no we didn't way. get a shirt. I ordered it the delivery day. I put it in here because you asked. It was December 17th to the 21st. Because the way that Teespring ships stuff is kind of weird. They like make it in batches so they yeah. can kind of collect orders and then print like maybe like five or six shirts all at the same time yeah um so yeah i did put in the sample order through the way i have our mugs they're upstairs oh nice you could have had those down here filled them full of diet too yeah we can go get it right now if you want um no nah. <laughs> well when we break for the ad spot we'll come back and they'll magically be here <laughs> okay uh you're wearing uh a fancy red and black with a bat on it oh yeah i'm mega shilling today got my cutting mat in front of me and then I got my tie dye hoodie on. Yeah, look at you. I'm wearing a trap. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm wearing. A, I'm wearing the Kingdom Death shirt. <laughs> nice. So I'm shilling for somebody else. We're very on brand today. All yeah. miniature related stuff. All minis, all the time. Up in this biz. Uh, all right. So we're done with the uh, with the preamble ramble. Yep. Which we is are. great. Yeah. Which is great. Um, uh -huh. I was going to talk about those in news. There's stuff behind us, so we'll talk about those in news. Okay. What have we painted, Scott? What have you painted? I don't know. If I remember mentioned this last time. Uh, I painted Balon Greyjoy mm. in a stream. I know I painted it a while ago, but I don't know if I ever mentioned it in the, in no, the podcast. No, you did not. No, you did not. Okay, uh, this is this is uh, the old the old dog himself, the old salty boy. Um, yeah, it's a speed paint. Maybe Balon I, Greyjoy. I love saying like like that. Balon Greyjoy. Yes, sure. But yeah, you know what you do if if you're a Greyjoy <laughs> and you get into a fight. What do you do? Right, if you're in the middle of a fight and then your sword gets knocked all out of the way by your opponent and you're scrapping and you're grabbing and you're going for knives and then you fall, you know, and then he's on top of you and he starts, he's going to go, he's going to kill you. What do you do? Well, you got to beat him off. <laughs> okay. Wait, that was, <laughs> that was a setup just for that joke. It wasn't related to Balon at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, that was under three hours. Um, painted on stream. Probably finished it like after stream. Like Does it feel evening. good to get like the mini mostly are all done on one stream? We got a little bendy sword in the back. Little, God damn little it. Little bendy sword. It's almost like he's using a little bit of a scimitar with that bend. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it that. Uh, yeah, it feels great. Um, I love painting models fast. I want to I want to paint Wendemir um, in today's stream. 
Wendemir. And Wend to God himself. I want to paint all the characters I use most frequently. And, and That's paint. a good way to start. Yeah. I just find that when I'm playing, uh, painting stuff for an army or for a game that I always start with the things I know I'm going to use most. Yeah. So you feel like you're like, oh, I'm getting the most value out of my time in painting. Definitely. Like when we, um, we were doing the stuff for the guild ball. Like I wasn't sure what my final team was going to be, mm-hmm. but I knew I was going to use Brisket as oh, my yeah. captain. Oh, yeah. She's the bee's knees. Do you have another captain? I don't know if you remember. I, I can't remember. They, there is another one. You can use, um, I think, one of the hair, versions of the Harry the Hat you okay. can use. Cool. Um, but he sucks balls <laughs> uh, in comparison to what he is in the other, like the Union or something. He's yeah. a, There's a version of him that's a way better captain. Yeah. I didn't know what my full team was going to be, but I knew I was going to use brisket. So I painted her first and she's, I think my best paint job of, of all of them. Cause you kind of go through your units right, more. And you right. kind of care but that is less. the one that should be the best. Yeah, it should be. And it's, but be Tom. ironically, she's also the one to, to score the goal first, yeah. but then the first to die. So yeah. she's on the field. The least. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. I just kamikaze bomb her in. You do. Ah, it feels so good. But yeah, you get, you get kind of far away. I mean, you could, she can sometimes jump out of the way, but sometimes Red Leader One yeah. gets shot down. <laughs> Certain teams will definitely kill her. Butchers will kill her. Um, other teams might not be able to kill her. Who knows? She has unpredictable movement, which is nice, but only She's a one-inch so melee radius. Yeah. So, and but after she scores, you can do the jog, the victory jog thing, and then she can like move again. So she can get out there. The problem is if you use her first to get in there and score, it means your guys haven't really moved yet. Yeah, yeah. And so they're all around. I can't go yeah. too far. Yeah. If you want to see this exact experience, <laughs> <laughs> we have a game and we play it uh, on a first episode of Kill Your Friends. We play Guild Ball, me and John. And that exact thing happens. <laughs> yes, it She does. doesn't die. I don't think Brisket ever dies, actually. No. Everyone got, else. You I took can, her out of commission. Yeah, I knocked her down, heavy burdened her, did all yeah, kinds of shit. Yeah. yeah. She had a lot of CC. Yeah, as the PC nerds would say, yeah, a little crowd control. Yeah. yeah, and so she was kind of out of commission there for the majority of the rest of the match. But yeah. sh- no spoilers. Go watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good video. It's long though. All right, what? What? Okay, little little thing. I want you to little thing to keep track of while you're watching the video. I get in the last <laughs> half of that video. Last half of that video, it's Scott does a really good editorial job. I'm so fucking pissed Dude, because yeah. you know when you're playing a game. <laughs> All right, you know when you're playing a game, let's, let's say you're playing a three-hour game, 40K or just Sigmar, and you know at turn one that you've already lost. But you didn't know that. I felt like I could see the sands through the hourglass falling through my fingers. That's I, the mortician effect, bro. Yeah, it was, ju- <laughs> it was just like a fat man was wi- laying on me. <laughs> I couldn't breathe. It was so frustrating, and I was like, if I had played more games, I probably would have known that, like, all I need is a one inch opening and then I can score again. And yeah. I did. Yeah. You yeah. did score again. And we don't know who won or lost, but I'll just tell you. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you that keep a close eye on like my my like facial expressions for the last half of that video. Yeah. And see how pissed off I am. Specifically <laughs> in the gameplay footage, because I spliced in interview footage, which was recorded years later. <laughs> years later. Uh, and years. John is much happier in that footage. Yeah. But I you know, I sprinkled it in to like kinda like you yeah. know, make it less obvious. I put on my best Daniel Day Lewis hat as we were doing that. I was like trying to like put myself in the mind frame of how pissed I was. Yeah. yeah. But not make it so uh like awkward to watch being pissed no you're good it was but, good you know what can i say i'm waiting for my uh academy award <laughs> um all right so you painted bail on Greyjoy. i i had two things that i painted yes the first thing was on the last stream i finished my fell bat nice so i i fussed with that for the stream prior and just did all the wings and stuff so high quality um and then i kind of i don't say i phoned it in but there was a lot less space to cover once i had all the wings done for mm-hmm. the second stream and it was me f- uh fiddling with this new paint this um oh the golden stuff yeah golden ultramat okay I th- this i think can't remember the exact name of the product but they're in these these kind of little jars kind of fairly large jars um Single single pigment, most of it's single pigment, and it's matte, and it comes out of the bottle or out of the jar creamy. I and I was super impressed with that paint. Um, so I'm gonna probably fuss with it some more. They have a, a fairly wide range, but I uh, I only have like the primaries and a couple of secondaries and then a uh, burnt 
umber. Okay. Um, but that was really fun to do that. So I painted that up. Now I realized, crap, I got two more bats to paint for that unit. And yeah. I don't want to paint it to that, uh, to that level. I think just the face and like the webbing on the skin maybe should be nice. And maybe just on the front of the model. Mm. Everything else just be like, whatever, wrap it up. Yeah. Well, one of them, one of them is like creepy bat hanging over a, um, creepy bat. <laughs> creepy bat hanging over a stone. So his wings are in. Oh. So he's like, <laughs> Is he's, he upside down? Yeah, yeah. What? Right. Is he upside down? No, he's not upside down. Okay, okay. But he's like crawling up over a oh, rock okay. and his wings are all into in oh. towards him. But the other one is like full spread, oh, both gosh. like golden eagle. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and those, the best thing about that is I'm putting so much time in that fucking bat and those are a unit of three and they're like 70, 60 or 70 points in Age of Sigmar, mm-hmm. which in Age of Sigmar, you play usually a 2,000 point game. So they are peanuts- and all they are is screens. They're screens. They yeah. have like a, a 15 inch movement. They oh, can shit. Yeah, they can fly anywhere. So what you want to do is you like torpedo them in front of something and you leave them like six inches away. And like you spread them out as much as you, you can. Spread them out. Yeah, yeah. And so their big, giant, scary death monster has got to like, <laughs> it has to just murder the bats. Okay. The bats whole purpose is to keep your scary thing to waste a turn killing them instead of killing what what you want to kill um so suffice it to say they'll be on the table for roughly eight minutes before they die <laughs> no. so there's that and i also painted my very first bus yes i painted a bus i painted, you painted a, it in six hours yeah i painted it yesterday uh six hours i i tracked my time because i was really curious about how long i wanted to paint it in one day how long it would actually take me of that six probably two and a half were painting the skin even though he doesn't have a ton of skin, it's basically just his face and then his arms. He's got and a hands. lot of skin, yeah. It's a lot of surface area. But you want to make that focal point the most striking. Yeah. And working on a, a bust face where you have more space to work, that also means that, like, you, I think the expectation level of what it looks like is higher. I think so. Um, and so I painted the whole thing and I'm like, I know I can go back in and I could spend another six easy. <sighs> To not be to like display quality, but to be to like, you know, I'm I'm pretty confident in this piece. But I think yeah. it looks pretty good for where it was at, and I did have a ton of fun doing it. Yeah. Um. And so in the after party, when we talk about something new we've tried. I'm not going to talk about painting my per- first bus. I'm going to talk about a technique that I use, um, to really help me with, um, atmospheric lighting. Okay. So. That was really fun, and I think it was kind of eye-opening. So Okay. Well, since you aren't going to talk about that in the after party, when you painted that bust, did you notice any differences between a bust and a uh, a larger figure? A bust versus like a 75 mil? Oh, sorry. Like a... Or a 32 mil. I saw something in the distance that got distracted. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> shiny. Uh, a bust and like a 32 mil. It's a gaming size yeah. figure. Oh, what's funny is... So I painted this... Um, <coughs> The video will be out by the time this podcast is out. It will be out last Friday. But um, this is a Christmas gift for my mom. For me, ma. <laughs> Which you know I'm making that joke in the video. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, His name is Cormac, isn't it? Cormac, yeah. And he's a Lucas Pena sculpt. Yeah. So now, like, the level of busts that I paint have to all be at that level. Oh, I'm yeah. not painting them. <laughs> Um, speaking of which, did you pre-order? Yes. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> By the time this video out, the pre-order will be gone. But Lucas Pena, uh, Spira Mirables, has launched another one with Merlin and the Arthur, baby Arthur. Baby Arthur. With his wooden sword. And also the bird uh, is called Merlin. No, wait. Merlin is the name of the owl in the sword. In this... Merlin is the wizard. Arthur's the king. And then the bird is like Mordecai. It's not Mordecai. It's it has a name. A. Phineas. Uh, Amber. Tra- it's not i was gonna say atreides but that's yeah, not, not a different thing arrakis <laughs> yeah it's something yeah it Shoot. has a really nice name i'm sure in the comments someone will find it for us because or scott will look it up right now um but uh okay so big differences all right so i'm painting this and my daughter came from from school yesterday and she wanted to come down and see the, the miniature for i painted for grandma and she's like oh i bet this was a lot easier than painting the little guys and so i had a conversation with her Wait, who said that? My daughter. Okay, okay. Um, and so I ended up, uh, I talked at her for about 10 minutes about, <laughs> about how they're different. And I said, it. in some ways it's easier. In some ways it's a lot harder. Um, it was really interesting because I've heard that before. I've heard that from multiple people. But to experience it myself, I totally get that. 
the expectation of details like the face, like the depth of color in the skin, like the nuance of human skin, like texture over the course of a fabric, how to differentiate his like rough linen shirt from a more smooth surfaced kind yeah, of yeah. cloak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the expectation is higher. And so you have to utilize a variety of t techniques, I think a little bit more. Um, whereas if you're painting a little thing, if you're painting a space Marine, you can kind of utilize your same, however you choose to layer, however you choose to blend, whatever you can kind of utilize that through the whole model and make it look really darn good. Like, yeah. I think you kind of have to, sp to spread out a little bit more to create different effects there. Um, so Text texturally, especially. Yeah, yeah. I ended up doing a lot of, um, lines, and specifically around he's got a mouse on his shoulder and he's got two birds and i used a lot of lines to to like build up the colors of like feathers or like fur um cross hatching to build up like layers of of showing wear and tear across surfaces a lot of lines to to show motion in hair mm -hmm. whereas there are some points where the hair is really well sculpted but across like his from just beyond like the top of his hair all the way through the back of his head there's very little lines there so to show that movement and show how the hair is kind of flowing you have to basically you're doing a lot of freehand yeah you know that's which true. i i'm not an expert now a lot of experience in freehand so that was it was really fun i enjoyed it a lot okay are you gonna paint another bus yeah for sure now that i've done this one i'm like i want to do another one so nice. i hope the video does really well so I do another video. <laughs> is the angle of the video gonna be busts don't have to be complicated to paint um because i feel like the story of the uh, the story of the video is or i my my working title right now is you should give away your painted models that's the name of the video okay hard disagree but i'm sure there's a yeah there's well, an asterisk what i mean by give away oh. is give as gifts hell yeah i, I totally agree yeah okay and i so love that that's it's a great a, idea it, it's about it's about sharing your passion in your skill and your uh craftsmanship with others whether or not they Absolutely. are interested in the hobby we're in and i found through painting that i loved painting that so much more than if i was just painting that bust for myself to put on a shelf in a cabinet yeah yeah like it was just it meant so much more to me to thinking about it it even affected the decisions i made wow we, we live in the midwest yeah and so when he she he's got two birds on on him i went with robins because they're very common here yeah. in the midwest mm -hmm. so i wanted to feel midwestern because it's for my mom who was born and raised and lived her whole life in the midwest in wisconsin minnesota and so i wanted to feel like something that she would associate with it and then he's got little feathers on his staff and i painted those as blue jay feathers so i did do some looking up of exactly how those things look and then paint them for her in thinking about Things she'll, as she's turning the model around, things she'll notice and yeah. things that she'll appreciate when she doesn't even know mini painting or whatever. So, right. um, yeah. That's super so cool. That's the that's the moral of the story is you should share your artwork with people as gifts. Absolutely. So I'm totally obviously agree. we're going to go through me painting my first bust in there and it is a miniature painting video. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's going to be aspects that I, that I'm learning and that I'm sharing too. So yeah, I kind of struggle with that in terms of formatting videos. Uh, I often have like generic or like, like interesting points in the beginning and the end and the middle is all technical information. Yeah. So I have like certain videos that I want to show like my family. Like I'm really, I, I like what I said in this video, but then I forget it's like 20 minutes long and there's like, 17 minutes of like hardcore painting detail yeah. and it's like they don't care about that and so the only time i've ever done a video where it's like like there's like a story running throughout the entire thing was the video where i had that fade model sculpted and talked about han the entire time oh yeah um and that did that did well but because i think it was the title was about it being like two thousand bucks or something um but yes yeah, so i've never tried to do that other than that one time but that is the thing i've been thinking about lately yeah i think it's it's one of those things that um, you've been doing this for a while, but this is not something that has like a storied history in in media of of kind of formulas or adaptations of formulas or evolutions. When you talk about like feature films and you talk about like how sitcoms are, are structured and all that kind of thing, um, especially in the sub niche of 
teaching a technical thing yeah. that is art and storytelling. Yeah. And that's the thing that um, interests me the most in the video creation is trying to find a rhythm, a combination, a, uh, a mood of this process that feels obviously both educational and, and, and uh, entertaining, but allows a free flow of that storytelling while still learning something and to get that kind of vibe of even if I don't paint minis, I still felt like fulfilling to have watched it and yeah. learned something. And that's really hard to it do. It is. Yeah. Cause there's so much crunch in there. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to, you don't want to like take your foot off the gas on the crunch. Cause people want to learn stuff yeah. or they want to go with you on the things you learned or, or things that you yeah. goofed up on and all that. And I want to share that too. Absolutely. But I think still think from a writing perspective um, that there's there's still room to grow. And, you know, oh, five yeah. years from now, oh, yeah. you and I are so much better at this. <laughs> that is the thing that I am most consistently proud of in videos as of late is being able to convey a thought in less words more efficiently. And because like, I, I think I used in the past, I used to just say so, so many words and just say so many things. And it's just like, I need to simplify this and speak more slowly. And then yeah, how to organize everything. I'm very proud of that. Like the video creation, I haven't been innovating that as much lately. And I kind of want to get back to that. Cause I like that as well. But yeah, the writing is definitely where I'm finding some joy. Why use lot words when little words work? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Caveman John, thanks for that. Oh, that's Kevin from The Office. Oh. That's a quote from... I'm sorry. I've seen The Office. Don't hate me, please. <laughs> All right, so we've gone through what we've painted. We've gone through preamble, ramble. Scott, do you enjoy painting Warhammer in the rain? That's probably the dumbest question I've heard in the last 20 minutes. Of course you don't. And luckily, you won't have to because today's video is sponsored by Umbrella Games. John, you realize I don't actually make umbrellas for you to use while gaming, right? Of course I do, because I read the uh, briefing prior to this recording, and I'm a goddamn professional. What Umbrella Games actually is, is a store for mini painters by mini painters. They pride themselves on fantastic hobby tools and miniatures. Everything they sell, they play and use. At Umbrella Games, you'll find the best in class in all hobby products. If you want the best brushes, they've got Artist Opus as well as others. If you want mini paints, they've got Scale 75 and all the other good ones. If you want the best clippers in the biz, they got the god hands themselves. They also have the best in class Tufts by Gamers Grass, who Scott is a major fan of. But seeing as Gamers Grass hasn't actually sent me all the Tufts like they sent Scott, I can neither confirm nor deny that these Tufts are actually legit. <laughs> they have a great selection of miniature war games like Warhammer, the ones we're all familiar with, Star Wars Legion, Marvel Crisis Protocol. So if you want to check out a new kind of online store, you can use our discount code TUP or TUP or follow the link in the description for 5% off their already low prices. Umbrella Games, because no hobbyist likes a soggy bottom. John, you know that's not the actual slogan, right? It is now. All right, we're about to get on to the topic of the day, and there's no better way to get onto the topic of the day than to start with a nice cold dew in your fresh tub mug. Oh, cheers. You dink it, and then you sink it. Mm. <sighs> Tastes so much better in a... Top mug. Mm -hmm. You must hold them like this the rest yeah, of the yeah. This is endorsed <laughs> by Scott and John. All right. The topic for today is about people. <laughs> people. What did you write? I'm curious what you write. People freaking, freaking over. <laughs> I'm just being freaking out over unpainted minis at the gaming table. Okay. So I went to a gaming tournament. I made a video about my experience. And three two to three people commented on the video giving me shit for bringing a unpainted army, a partially unpainted army, mostly unpainted army. Let's, let's be honest here mm -hmm. to a tournament. And like, they were, they were like actually upset that I would, that I would do that. And I was like, okay, this is a thought people have. Maybe it's the minority. Mm -hmm. of, so of you thoughts. like ripped off the, uh, the air brushing uh, gloves and were like, okay, we're no, no, talk no. about this. Now. No, no. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I was like, oh, this is an interesting concept. I think definitely it's a minority thought, but I want to kind of explore all avenues of this. We're going to explore the minor minority report. 
Yes. Correct. But like minus like the creepy amniotic fluid and the ladies that are bald and floating juices and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the balls come down from the sky. Yeah, no balls. Thunk. Yeah, there's not going to be any balls in this episode. <laughs> Showing that Scott murdered I mean. me in the future. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, okay. The general notion is that you want to respect your opponent's gaming experience, not ruin their immersion by playing with an army that's unpainted. That that's that's an element of it. Uh, maybe is, an, is that what people think? That's what one person said to me. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> that was one thing. I assume the other thing is like you should have pride in your own army and only play with it fully painted. Um, I'm I'm grasping right here because you're trying to put yourself in that mindset to figure out why people would get so upset. Okay. Here's another thing. I have a slogan that's paint more minis yeah, and people give me shit about playing games with unpainted minis all the time. Yeah, I get that. And I am consistently painting things, but the problem is the rate of acquisition far outpaces the rate <laughs> of painting. I think we can all feel that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, when people see that I'm playing with an unpainted army, it's like, isn't your slogan paint more minis? And it's like, no, I'm painting. I'm just, I can't paint at all. It's so many. <laughs> which so is why, many minis. Which is why I'm giving away a lot of it. Um, Cause I'll never get to it. And I want someone else to hopefully put, their brushes on it yeah put your brush right on it <laughs> you dirty girl <laughs> no, no balls <laughs> so okay is it like all right i don't know if you want to give your opinion first i can give my opinion first all right I, I'll, I'll share some of my own um real life experience with oh this. yes please do and then and then we can kind of dig in a little bit so um before the covid times <laughs> I used to play quite a bit at my local store. We had a we had a Age of Sigmar club. Um, I also did a bunch of Warhammer Underworlds and some 40k. And people like to give other people shit, and people <laughs> tended to give me the most shit oh, yeah. about not having my stuff all painted. Yeah, are you the painter? Yeah, right. Hey, didn't you win an award for painting? Why isn't all your stuff painted? <laughs> yeah. If you're good at one thing, you should, you should be good at the entire landscape of mini painting. <laughs> yeah. I got... I never saw anybody else get shit about it. <laughs> but I sure as hell did. Now, I do give my buddy Blair a good amount of shit because he hasn't painted anything. <laughs> He hasn't started painting. So this is my way to entice him to paint more is to start painting. If he were to start painting and you kind of get working on it a little bit, then I immediately back off. But I, and it's not like I'd show up. I'd be similar to your, your Greyjoy army. Like I have a unit of 10 skeletons were painted. I had, uh, you know, a bunch of my hero models were painted, but I didn't have all 2000 points painted. Yeah. And so. The weird thing is, is oftentimes, more times than not, the people that are giving me shit, their army's not painted. So I'm playing them in a the game and they're giving me crap and their army's not painted. And I'm yeah. just like, okay, okay. So I think we can maybe unpack a little bit why, what are, what are the reasons why people are this way? What are the, is there, is there like, is there like a realm where it's like, okay, a realm where it's not okay? What, what does that look like? I don't know. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I think maybe some of the feelings can be born out of uh, a typical tournament setting where like you need to come with a painted army. Mm -hmm. That's like a requirement. Mm -hmm. And so when that's not a requirement, maybe people still kind of like have those feelings where it's like, oh man, well in the past I've grinded to like finish completing an army and this sap didn't have to do any of that work. And so right. now I'm salty about it. Right. Um, so I think maybe it can come from that a little bit. Yeah. I think people, uh, if you're not, uh, an avid player or you've not played at a bunch of different kinds of events of different sizes may assume they all work that way yeah when in fact and this is kind of one of my i'll, I'll just hit my biggest point right now because this <laughs> leads into it and in fact smaller local tournaments um smaller local leagues um tournaments that have four eight twelve players they often don't have that requirement. In fact, I've never seen a small local tournament have a painting requirement. Why? The big reason why is you want to be creating an environment that fosters new players, that brings new people in, that gets people to come and join your tournament. And any roadblocks you put up for that 
You're simply narrowing the amount of people that will come, that will participate. And painting is a big one. It's not me driving 300 miles to Chicago to play at the Adepticon Age of Sigmar tournament. Yeah. That's not what I'm asking. You can do that in six hours. Yeah. I'm going to my local store, my city of 100,000 people, and we have like 12 people that play Age of Sigmar. If we were going to do a small tournament and we required your army to be painted, we wouldn't have a tournament yeah, because not enough people have all their stuff all painted or they're more casual players and they don't want to really in, in invest in all of that just to play their game. They just want to play their game. So to me, a big thing about local Song of Ice and Fire scene, local any game scene, is to, is to not require that, is to encourage that is to what I would usually say to my my players that I played against was hey next time we play I had a lot of fun I hope to see a couple more of your models painted next sure, time we play yeah. if you're making strides towards it that's all that matters to me yeah. it's showing that you are, you want it to you want to do it but you're not stressing yourself out or putting these these weird deadlines on yourself to do it. Now, if you were going to go and play in a big tournament that required painting, then yeah, it's self-imposed that you know that you've got to do that. But to me, I just want people to play the game. If they're if they're showing up and everything's gray plastic, that if I show up and they're just gluing the last couple of dudes together so they can play, if they're showing up and they've got a, a new box of models that they couldn't play yet and they're going to want to proxy a different model for that with the same base size, I will let them do it 100% of the time. Because I know they're, they, that they are bought a thing, that I know that they're invested, I know they want to play. And that's just it. We want to foster a good environment. So yeah. being a gatekeeper of saying that crap needs to be painted before you can play is so ridiculous. And all you're doing is you're hurting the thing that you love if you love this game. Is you're hurting the opening of new players to come and enjoy it with you and to have a more robust community, which means you can get more pickup games, which means your local tournament can get bigger, which means that you just get to do it more, right? And I think that that's a, a good thing. That's honestly the the thesis of this episode, so we can just end it right now. No, I'm just kidding. I there is also an element of people felt like I had an obligation to show people the right way of doing things. And if, if Scott's going to a tournament with an unpainted army, that means that I can too. You can. Yes. That's yeah. exactly what we're saying. Yes. <laughs> and I, I don't mind that. Yeah. If 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 not having a painted army is going to stop you from going and getting to experience a really fun part of this hobby, that's fucked up. And you should, that's bad. You should go and experience that part of the hobby. Painted army or not painted army. But yes, John's right. Making strides towards completing it is the important part. Um, but let's kind of unpackage this. Why do tournaments require you to have painted armies in the first place? Hmm. Why is that? So like there's the immersion thing. That's kind of a different question I want to ask, but that's a potential reason. Um, but what are other reasons that they want their thing to look cool and like impressive? Their tournament? Yeah. Well, I think that this hobby really is unique um, compared to other things. When I try to think of what other things are similar, and we talk about playing board games that even have miniatures, we talk about playing video games, we talk about playing card games like Magic the Gathering. Those are much more one-dimensional in what encompasses the the hobby. Now you could say like, well, actually, card collecting is is also a part of Magic, or you know, I don't know, deck building, um, building up your own block for to do your own drafts. And there's there's other aspects to it. But no other game that in the kind of nerd sphere hobby really requires you to do more than just buy the thing and, and play the game, more than miniature, miniature wargaming. Um, because it's seen as a whole package, right? You know, it's like the food pyramid <laughs> where there's it's, you know, you got to go up each step if you want the full pyramid. And that is the the kind of pinnacle of this is to have the whole pyramid filled out. And part of that is having a fully painted army. And I guess like the very tippy top, that's not actually part of the pyramid, but there's just like a little speck up there that like some people think is part of the pyramid, but it's not part of the pyramid. And that is like the lore of your army. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, outside of that, like it's, it's considered if, to be, if you want to fully experience all that this 
thing has to offer. You need to do it all. And painting is part of doing it all. And you think tournament organizers, short to TOs, in case you want to be cool, uh, worldwide, not worldwide, but almost <laughs> the majority of them believe that. They believe that painting is a critical part of the hobby and they want to make sure that like, if people walk by and see the tournament, they, they see the full, the full, like, what am I trying to say? The full pyramid. <laughs> Yes. Monty. Yeah, they see the pyramid. Yeah. Luckily, by walking by, they don't see that speck of lore on top. No, they don't no, see no, that. Yeah, yeah. Don't actually sit and ask. So like someone. a random guy walks by and like, oh, look at all these miniatures. They're painted. That's the hobby. But the alternative universe, they walk by, there's minis, but none of them are painted. Then the people think maybe the hobby is less cool. Maybe it's, it's less impressive. Less to the impressive. Viewer. So it's, okay, so maybe there's an element of that. TOs want the hobby to look as impressive as it can be so they make sh all the things painted yeah i think it's probably the that i didn't know we were talking about it through the the guise of a to you probably said that and i didn't hear it well no yeah like, why um, do they care but uh, uh f i guess from a tournament organizer from an an event planner runner yeah. standpoint um we're talking specifically about big ones here, not like your small local ones, but from like a big standpoint, you you do want to showcase that what you're doing is to be recognized both internally and externally. So it's less about the hobby side of feeling like, you know, all your players get to feel the full extent of, of this hobby because you could just commission your army to be painted. You know, you didn't have to experience all of that to play at my tournament with my requirement for painting but they want a bit of i think legitimacy to the work that they're putting in mm -hmm. and so it's a ton of work to put a massive tournament on and they've got all these tables and they've got all these cool terrain and all this stuff that it's not just playing on a you know a, a broken old door with uh books with, and soda cans books and soda cans on it right it is setting the scene of visual impressivity, which is the word. <laughs> <laughs> so you want the highest level of visual impressivity. So when you're taking... <laughs> so just keep using it. <laughs> so, so when you're sharing up on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the tweeters of your event <laughs> and you show pictures of it while you talk about the results, you talk about the turnout, you talk about the prizes, you got a visual impressivity <laughs> to impress upon the viewer. And right. they're like, whoa, look at that table. That dragon is huge. And he's painted awesome. Yeah. That's, you want the storytelling of the thing we did and how much work it was and how awesome it was and how many people showed up to visually carry that same weight of impact. And I think that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, it seems like a massive entry, a barrier to entry. And, it, and from like, let's looking at the other side, it's like, what do you want? Like the most hardcore competition you could, you could get to make your tournament like the best. And so put, putting down barriers seems like it makes sense. But it's like it's like a concession they're willing to make. They're like, I bet there are players that that might be very good competitors that choose not to play in those tournaments because they just don't have the the willingness to paint a full army. Mm. I think if you're that invested and you're that like entrenched in the game, um, that I think you kind of know that's like that's like what you signed up for. That, yeah. But that's because it's been made an expectation. Right. It's, right. it's part of the hobby. Yeah. Right. If 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 it was such that there were 10 major tournaments in your country in a year and five of them required painting and five of them didn't yeah you could say oh, i'm still a hardcore heavy competitor and i don't have to paint this stuff i'm just going to go to the five where i don't have to and yeah. you'd have that and that could be like this struggle for a power struggle and an internal kind of confrontation that would happen amongst your community to fight itself over this is dumb why do they require that this is what we should all strive for they should all require that and we we're creating drama where it doesn't need to happen luckily we don't have that as far as i know i i can't think of other like big tournaments that from miniature wargaming that don't require painting and if they do they're small enough in number that it's the the expectation is still such that you have your army painted. Okay. And granted, it's not. We're not saying you got to. You have to. Your army needs to be painted to such an incredible level that it takes you a year or more to do it. There are videos out there on the internet on how to paint your army in a weekend. This or, guy or a week 
Don't, or, don't right, go to whatever. my channel. <laughs> <laughs> go to this guy's channel. <laughs> the, or go check out Vincey V's channel. He's, or Vincey V, yeah. He, he can paint an awesome Speaking of Vincey V, Vince always watches the episode and then messages us live while he's watching it on Facebook. He is definitely going to have some thoughts. Watch and react. Ab- about this episode. Oh, yeah. He's got he's got a lot yeah, of knowledge yeah, in yeah. that big I'll, shiny dome of his. I'll guarantee, <laughs> bef- before he gets to this point in the podcast, he will have already messaged us. Yeah. And then he'll get here and he'll be like, yes, you are right. <laughs> yeah. There should really be a like a a live watch. There is of this show. Oh, you can do that. It's called uh, premieres. Yeah, you could do a premiere, but no chat is allowed other than Vince. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the premiere of Vince watching Trapped Under Plastic. Yeah, yeah. It's not Trapped Under Plastic. It's Vince Vince watch and react. Vince, there's another video you can add to your weekly schedule <laughs> on top of the 17 other videos you make a week. Yeah, it's just a camera over his shoulder of the screen. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then like him space talking. bar, pause it and like turn to the camera. That's this bullshit. Is, this is why these guys are wrong right now. <laughs> People would watch that. <laughs> and then he'd be stealing our views and we have to come after him. Yeah. Oh, well, I want to come after you, Vince. Don't I can't even. Come after you, Vince. Does like 80 push-ups. Every morning. Probably like 150. I don't know. At it's, this point. It's an absurd it's amount. Over 9,000! <laughs> <laughs> All right. More thoughts about this. I think tournaments are kind of the premier showcase of our hobby, both within its own sphere and then X number of rings outside of it. So when we're talking about people being exposed to the game or learning about the game or they play a different game and they want to see this one... One of the kind of bigger things that would come up on their radar would be an event or talking about things, big things that are happening. Those are more newsworthy items. So you want the things that people to see to be kind of a full showcase of what the game has to offer. Yes. And a big part of that is how cool the miniatures look. And the miniatures look cooler when they're painted. Yes. So I think you want to have create the version of the world that you want to be a reality, right? We want this hobby to be in a utopian society all painted armies every game is played is this epic battle that plays out on a little table with little army men (laughs) and they 12 times have to fight the dragon (laughs) (laughs) you're ruining it um and so you, you you want you want to see that so like when you were a little kid and you went to the Games Workshop store mm-hmm. and you walked in. Did they have like a, a glass case or display or anything of like painted miniatures on a table that looked like cool? Or Absolutely. That, that, how much did that excite you versus the cardboard boxes on the wall? They had cool pictures on those as well. But like seeing the physical thing. Did yeah. You, is that a memorable experience? Yeah, Absolutely. Now, I will say that the store's objective is to get you to buy the models, whereas a tournament is not selling anything. So, you know? I, I, I think it's it's about thinking of them as ambassadors to the game that they love. Yeah. I don't put all my time, effort, and energy into running a tournament if I don't love that game. That's like, that's just crazy talk. Yes. Or in some cases, probably like a person you love is really passionate about that and you help them a lot. Right, he's like, like you're a good person to do administrative tasks and stuff. There's a lot of things that are not probably fun to do that aren't really hobby related to run a tournament. You help them, but for the most part, you want this game to succeed. You want the people to have opportunities to play it. You want to have big cool events, and if you want that to continue, that requires a certain level of new blood of growth to mm-hmm. happen. Most likely way to get your hobby to grow, to get your tournament to grow for people to see how cool it is yeah and that's that i think that kind of just comes down to that all right let's talk about the other reason which is m- immersion immersion okay so there's no e in the front of that word no immersion immersion so obviously we can only speak from our personal perspective because everyone's going to enjoy the hobby in a different way but while i'm in the thick of a game Generally speaking, I'm not thinking much about like the narrative of the story or what's happening. I'm thinking about all the technical details, how to win the game. Yeah. So is there immersion for you in a in a game of miniature war game? Has there ever been immersion? Like what's the most immersion you've experienced? I really don't get immersion. I mean, this is just me personally. Yeah. I don't get it in miniature wargaming. I get it in a really good miniature board game. 
I get it in obviously, really? obviously in D and D, um, but in a miniature war game, it's so focused on the strategy, the rules, trying to think of it as a chess match of what are they trying to do, what am I trying to do to counter that, how can I play on their weaknesses, how can I combat their strengths. I'm not sitting there staring at fancy little happy figures that are all painted. Now, that's also the way I approach the game. Yes. yes. You know, I know a lot of people, I see it a lot, especially in 40K, in in our community at least, they have no interest in paying or playing at a tournament. They have no interest in playing competitively. They love to run narrative games. They they set up narrative campaigns. They set up these really ornate, you know, stories and just sitting back and talking about the events that unfolded. And that's a really cool thing. I like that people are that way because it means that there's more depth or dimension to our hobby than just the way you play is you play to win and that kind of thing. And so I can see where that would be a, a thing people would like awkwardly enough though again small sample size the four guys i can think of in our local plays that really play 40k that way don't play with painted armies no <laughs> so it's 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 kind of a a weird dichotomy there yeah um and two of them specifically are v- very like they're whiners but they uh <laughs> One of them is the most notorious. Every time you talk to the guy, he talk. Uh, I swear to God, he talks about how bad his dice rolls were and how bad I he lost. I fucking cause his, cause hate his, that because they were rolling better and I lost because I. Broke. I hate that. Yeah. So he's that guy, and he's also dude. Com- don't be that guy. <laughs> it's like you lost because you lost. Okay, yeah. any number of reasons dice rolls contribute. Yes, but it's not the main reason you lost. Okay, if you're that guy. That's my, that's my message to you. Okay. Yeah. And if if you here's the other thing. If you're like everybody has that guy in their their hobby circle, if you can't identify that guy, it's probably you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so oh, no. just be careful. Now, that's not to say like in the moment, in a turn, in a pivotal combat sequence, you roll all ones, you're like, "Damn it, I needed you now more than ever." Yeah. Right? That's fine. That's that's it's a it's a microchasm. It's an event when when randomness right that's that's games are random that's how games work there's a level of randomness that's the excitement that's the part of it it's the gambling side of it of not knowing the outcome before you ever played the game right for most games yes for most games yes but and this is one of those having a level of uncertainty involved is what keeps it's exciting right it's like um so yeah be careful of that <laughs> he's also the complainer that complains about painting and almost in a way like painting is wrong and painting is dumb and it's not nothing's on him uh, so he doesn't like dice he doesn't like painting bro you're in the I wrong you're in the wrong hobby. I don't know. maybe I he likes know. the lore he does <laughs> like to to make up the stories <laughs> just had an idea I, i'm working with a writer right now to write backstories for my wood house and he's a professional writer uh, he has published works and he's really talented he has really awesome ideas what if we worked with a writer that could be that, that guy and he wrote like some kind of some kind of story for us that we progressed through in, in game format with really cool like boards, really cool painted figures, really cool terrain, like like maybe even like smoke effects, like light effects, narration effects. And like you, you ham it out all the way to the to the to the top. It's almost like a live production, right? Yeah. And like you and I get to experience it. And like we kind it's of like stop see. motion. It's almost like stop motion film, but instead of it being stop motion to to show what the story was playing out, it's actually the gameplay. Well, maybe yeah, that that would be the gaming element. But you could have like visual elements too. You could like have a projector that's shining on the back screen that has like a forest canopy with like leaves rustling through, and you can have you have like sound effects. You could like basically like if anyone is ever going to be immersed, it's going to be in this experience. And if right. we don't feel it, we know it's not for us. Right. Sounds like a really difficult thing to do, but I really want to try. It sounds really freaking cool. Because <laughs> it's storytelling that uses the the actual game to tell the story. Right, yeah. And you could, I mean, you you and I or anyone that wanted to do this could have a, a hand in contributing to the narrative, like what the story is. Right. Um, so it could right. be interesting. I mean, it could be sci-fi. It could be fantasy. It could be whatever Dude, you want. This could be like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Do you ever read Choose Your Own Adventure when you're a kid? Uh, no, but I'm familiar with the concept. Okay. So he writes key points in the story. Yes. Okay. And 
he's got choose your own adventure paths. Okay. Okay. We tell the untold of story of how the Conan's adventurers tribe mounted its way into the chasm and they came across <laughs> these skeletons. Okay, right? That's like we have an awesome cinematic intro of like yeah. the setting the scene, Some cool shots. And, yeah, and it hears and, and the first battle unfolds, and then it's us actually playing. the the out the the uh, actual outcome isn't determined. Yeah, and based on the outcome of the game, it's to choose your own adventure path, and then the other options that he wrote. Yeah happen and and so the story is unfolded but the the audience is aware that the story and how it ends is still within the hands of the gods to decide yeah and like each video is like a chapter of the process yes and so you're there for the story you're excited you don't know how it's going to end because the game still has to be played this is a tv show yeah this is a TV show. This is this is how we get on the Bravo network. Yeah. You pay like you can even pay like voice actors to have like, you know, like uh you know, narrate the story yeah. or have be a certain character. And even we could hear that like before playing to kind of get us in that mindset, even. Does anybody know Morgan Freeman? Because <laughs> <laughs> I want him to be the voice of God as the narrator in this. <laughs> okay. Because how great would that be? I'm sure we can make it happen. Yeah. I want to do this so bad right now. Yeah, it sounds like a really fun idea. Oh, honestly. man. It sounds like something you could get on Warhammer Plus, but you can't because we should do it first. Yeah, right. Okay. I would, but yeah, you would need to hire people to do that. Like, I would even hire like commission painters, commission train builders. Cause I wouldn't be able to accomplish all that in a, no. yeah, in you a need, good time Yeah, you need frame. the actual like fully sculpted let's get jeremy from black magic craft to oh, yeah. make all of our boards for us oh no well, not all of our boards we can have like a, a Zorp- special zorb you know, could do one okay. Blackie? i wanted to bring up zorb zorb in terms of immersion like i could imagine playing oh, on his full shit. size minas tira thing yeah as being immersive the realm of gondor yeah his videos are so fucking good <laughs> I know, they're dude. so well put together all right so i got uh, uh i got drunk the other night <laughs> <laughs> and i was watching his latest video Oh, yeah, I watched it too, yeah. And I commented on it, and like right away, because it's probably Australia lands, it was like 8 in the morning, and he sends me a message right away. And I got in this conversation, and I'm like, dude, count me in. I'm going to do some shit. Let's do something. Dude, I want to be involved too. All right, good. It's so epic. I want to like paint like a really nice figure to like go somewhere on, in, in Minas Tirith. Yeah. I want to paint Waldo. Where's Waldo? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, John. <laughs> But it's like, yo, where's Waldo? <laughs> oh, he's got like a wizard's robe on. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, somewhere in this video, you got to find Waldo, and then you got to put the timestamp of exactly where you put it in the comments section. <laughs> Dude, this is the thing. Like, I wanted to paint like Boromir, and John's like, I want to play Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> the That's the difference between you and me, Scott. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yes, that is one one of the differences. Not there aren't many, but that that illustrated that one perfectly. Um, I'm glad that that's where this conversation went. That then it went from painting your models for a game to us coming up with the greatest video series idea ever to grace the YouTubes. And where's Waldo in Minas <laughs> <laughs> Dude, in, in, in terms of a series, I think that would keep people coming back too. I know. Yeah. I it the, the biggest thing for me is if I can envision how exciting that is, how cool that would be as a viewer, then it makes me excited to want to make it it is it it's a heavy lift oh yeah you start unpacking all that 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 takes all the works you need to do yeah the works the yeah work. but we, yeah like we can get people to make all the boards paint the models and then write the yeah stories. then they then they can put them on like their youtube channels and we can direct people to how the board was made mm-hmm. there's a video on it yeah Oh man, that was the idea with Kill Your Friends. I-, I wanted to make my own terrain, and I made my own terrain for Guild Ball, but I didn't film it, and I painted my own squad, but I didn't film all of it. But you could reference it in the gaming video. Yeah, it's like it's perfect, but it's like I can't do it all. It's ah! a lot of stuff. Stuff takes so much time. If that's, if that's all I did, then I could do it. But I like to paint other things. I like to paint busts, full figures. I'm like, you know, I like to eat tendies. Yeah. I like to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pee on occasion. <laughs> but yeah, that's a fun idea. We should look into it. All right, yeah. Well, we're going to put that down. On we're going to kickstart that. That's Kickstarter. Find oh, that good. link below. Give us money and we'll oh, do dude, it. That's a way to do it. That is a way. I mean, that's why I was considering for Kill Your Friends, but now I think we can probably just do it ourselves with the office space. Yeah, that that's that's a good idea too. 
Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, this this is the Kickstarter idea. This is yeah, it. Yeah. We actually have to get enough like narrative primo sexy like shots and, and voiceover oh, of yeah. like here's what you here's what we're doing. We'll have camera operators. Mm-hmm. We'll have fucking we'll roll out the fog machines. Camera one, yeah. camera two, camera two. Fade in. Fade out. Mike <laughs> Mike check. I'm just saying whatever words. <laughs> I don't know what they mean. Interior. I'm all hacked up a Mountain Dew right now. And I got a good idea. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Well, I mean, out of this conversation, we, we've discovered a, a new series, so that's good. Or it's a terrible idea, and in the comments below, you should tell us to never talk of it again. I can't see that happening. I think I feel like the goody peepees are going to encourage us. Yeah, they're going to be like, "You need to make this happen, or we'll cancel our patronage." I'd be like, right. "Shit, okay, we're, next level or held this. hostage." Next level on this, we make our own game. Oh, God. That is the game uh, that we play. For the series, because otherwise we're just shilling for somebody else's game. Yeah, we got. I think I think that's one concession we got to make. We got to show for unless we else's game. unless we do it in rain and hell, and then we're doing it for Adam and Vince, oh, and then the hellish landscape, yeah, dude. dude. Little like bubbling like sulfur pits. Yeah. That then it's okay because yeah. we like them. Yeah. Yeah. And we can use whatever the hell minis we want. Yes, that's true. Agnostic board game. Check it out. Rain and hell. Links below. Even fuck it. <sighs> We're not being paid for this. Not a sponsor. All right. I think that was enough discussion. You want to say other things about this topic? I want to hear, because this is just John and I's opinion, and because it is subjective, I want to hear your opinions. I want to hear what you think about immersion like in games. Do you experience that? Like, Is there a certain level of prep that needs to happen for you to experience immersion? Does playing, with, playing an opponent with unpainted miniatures make the experience worse for you in a noticeable way such that you don't want to play at all? Maybe it offends you even? Uh, like, what are the legitimacy of these claims? Let us know. We, we want to know. I've paint, I've played like a half dozen games with my fully painted Osiarch Bone Reaper army. Yes. And the last one I played was was the last one when we were at VincyCon. Yeah, yeah. And he stomped me so incredibly hard <laughs> with his Giants army. So hard. That I now don't like painted <laughs> armies. <laughs> Wait, you, you you now don't like painted armies in general? No. Yeah, I don't want to play with painted armies. They just get beat, and it feels worse. <laughs> it feels worse because I did all that freaking time into painting that fucking army, and he just is like turn one. He's like, uh, <laughs> I step on all your skeletons. Fuck you, Vince. <laughs> all right. You're ruining the game. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't see this coming, but this is a reason to not have painted. <laughs> All right, I want to talk one more thing. I wanted to talk about this quick before yeah, we yeah, wrap yeah, it yeah. up because I I had an idea and I lost it. Now I, I I caught it again. It was just like a little weasel Whoa. running through the weeds, and I caught the weasel. Um, it's a snitch playing at either smaller tournaments, playing at local game clubs, playing in, playing in a league with an unpainted force. It affords you something. It affords you practice. It affords you working with models or units or whatever to find out what you like best, what's the strongest, what yeah. works best with your strategy before committing hours and hours and hours to paint this unit of 120 zombies. And then you find <laughs> out, like, uh, actually, the the army I want to play doesn't run any zombies yeah and i needed some practice games to figure that out or like just looking at the rules of how this good this unit is what the points are blah 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 blah. so i'm gonna paint a whole bunch then i play like there's a certain level of expectation that once you've invested so much into painting a thing of what it's supposed to do and i have had people that they have painted like really hard to paint a big unit of, of models and we play a game and I wipe that unit off in the first round, and I you can see it physically feels worse yeah. than it does if you hadn't painted those yet because you didn't realize that they're going to fit or not fit. So I think there's a part of that, part of why um, small tournaments, at least from my experience of playing smaller Age of Sigmar tournaments, one of the big values that they do is it's a good it's a training montage for going to the big ones. Yeah, right. It's me get working out my list versus a, a wide variety of different armies, different opponents, finding out what works, finding out what things you want to tweak, finding out what's stronger in the meta and how I can uh, you know, approach combating that. And a lot of that is done in list design. It's also done in strategy and planning and, and how you attack them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it is practice. And part of practice is tweaking your list, right? So painting your 2,000 points and not a single other model, and you worked your butt off to do that, to find out you're going to tweak three or four of those units and maybe a hero or HQ, um, it can kind of hurt. Now, they're not gone forever. It's not like you have to throw them in a fire and be like, well, I guess I can never use these again. But it, it's a little bit demeaning. You know, so it's sometimes like I, if I had enough practice games, if I had five, five, ten practice games in with this list and I'm really happy with it, I started by painting the heroes I know I'm going to use. Or I know I'm going to use it a ten ske- unit of ten skeletons. It's cheap. It's great for holding an objective. I can paint those as I go. And as my list kind of comes together, I'll be more confident in what I'm what I'm painting. So. I totally feel that. Yeah, because as a Greyjoy player in the Song of Ice and Fire, my list options were like massive when I first started out. Mm-hmm. And now I've played maybe like 30 games or so, maybe a little bit more. And now I'm kind of down to like a selection of things that I like. Yeah. And so now I now I know what to paint. And so I paint characters that I use most often. And doesn't that feel good? It does. Yeah, it feels good. It feels it feels efficient. It's like, I know I'm going to use Balon Greyjoy. I know I'm going to use Windermere. So I'm going to paint those guys and then I get to use them all the time. It's good. It feels so good. That's going to do it for this topic. Um, Let's get out of the newsy news. Am I right this time? Is it news? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, Woo! News. John, after three seasons, finally understands the flow of the episode. Yes. Out of the news. Can we talk about airbrushes first? Let's do it. All right. I got two new airbrushes here. In the last like two and a half, three years, <laughs> I bought two airbrushes. In the last week, I got two more airbrushes. <laughs> Um, first one is the Harder and Steenbeck Squidmar Edition Evolution. Um, Squiddy sent this to me as an early Christmas present because he is a gentleman and a scholar. And uh, I used it in my uh, my recent bust painting for the first time. And it is it is the sexiest looking airbrush I have ever seen. Yeah, the print on the outside is fucking hot. Dude, he's got his logo the, on the lid, too. The matte gold is kind of nice, too. Yeah. It's a beautiful airbrush. I had never, like, I'd seen and was familiar with your Harder and Steenbeck. Um, it, it runs like a dream. It doesn't have the side grip. It's on, straight down the barrel there. Because weren't you talking about the side grip, weird side grip thing? Um, or is that oh, a different it's, brand? It's the trigger? Yeah, the trigger. Yeah, the trigger has a, a different pattern on the one, the evolution that I have. Yep. Um, runs great. I have used the, the airflow modulator right on the brush. So that's this thing right down here. Oh, it has a, a Mac valve on it. Yep. I did use that as I was going to do do really like faint um, kind of inks and stuff. And okay. that re- worked really, really well. Um, but yeah, it's cool. I'm not sure if you can still get it by the time this video comes out or not. But the Evolution, Harder and Steenbeck Evolution is what this model is. So you could get that even if you didn't get the squiddy oh, one. It's a heavy boy. It is It is a heavy boy. Okay, I will say this though. When you get it in the package, this is probably just how they package it. Um, it has two cups and it comes with the smaller cup. And the, you know, the, the cups unscrew, which I'm still a little bit scrupulous about. You can even use it with no cup in it. And I've done that you in know, the past. It's a ballsy move. It comes with this little <laughs> cup. I cannot... Doesn't matter how little amount of paint or ink I put in this cup, I could not, not make it make a mess. And in what way? When you do a little backflow, and it's just like when you're mixing up the paint in it, bloops over the side. Like I'm just apparently a messy person. Yeah, get so, good. What the fuck? Yeah. So this you? little cup is too little. <laughs> it's too little. Too little. Lil Sebastian dude, size. Classic AOL messenger name from back in the day, dude. Lil, and then add your last name. Put on some fucking numbers that you like as a kid, dude. Yeah, dude. I'm just Lil. Just Lil John. Lil John 888. 666. Oh, yeah. Um, so I went up to the big boy right away. Okay. Big boy. This is cool. It's got a couple different needle sizes and nozzle noozles. Noozles. The noozle comes out without a tool, and you can pull the whole thing out. So nice. And so just the needle is exposed. Huh? Uh, So that's fucking sweet because this whole section here, all these little things is where you're going to get like crusties and clogs. Yeah, that's what you clean the most. Most of the time and to have quick access to it. I was telling uh, Scotty before we started the episode that that's the thing that interests me most of this. Um, This this brush, not like in terms of actual technical use while I'm painting. um, Seems very similar to my water clips, but not worse. I haven't used it enough to say it would be worse or better, but that immediately, I love that. Okay, that's the first one I got. 
Second new airbrush that was just released, and I did buy this one. This is the Monument Tools, Monument Hobbies Pro Air TG made by Grex. This, never never used a Grex airbrush. I have a bazillion airbrushes. They just kind of flock to me. I don't have a Grex one. Dude, this is the fucking Ruger. Yeah, dude. Pistola. Bam, 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 bam. There's a, there's a skit in here somewhere with that as a gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, Daryl's going to be using this at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> He's going to see if he can put in like... He's going to try to put in like a 9 millimeter bullet somewhere. <laughs> He's like, where 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 the bullet fit? <laughs> Just stick. Actually, if you open, if you crack open the top of a shotgun shell, you could just pour the powder down inside of the cup. Oh my god! <laughs> and then you just need a little spark. Uh, that's dangerous. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. So this is a this is a pistol grip, and it's pre- pretty heavy. Um, and so when you just touch the trigger a bit, you can pull it back to there. It just does air. And then when you get to the full crank back, boom, you can ease in that paint. So I haven't used this one yet. But Grex is a high quality brand and they've done this kind of stuff with the pistol grips before. And I know um, Jason from Monument uses a Grex with a pistol grip and he's very, very good at airbrushing. So um, one of the things that I hear people say is you're just not going to get the control. You can not, There's no way that you can do as good at airbrushing with that as you can with another one. And I'm like, well, go watch Jason's stream and tell me that because that yeah. dude is really, really good with an airbrushing. And to me, for someone that's used to using a gun, like this grip, I just feel like, I don't know. I, I would say like when you're holding it like a like a, a pencil grip for a tradition air, airbrush, you're not looking down the sights anyway. There's a certain amount of just know-how yeah. of knowing where it's going to go, and that comes with experience and yeah. understanding of the tool. Yeah, yeah. I don't think holding it like this or holding it like traditionally makes any goddamn bit of difference yeah. on your control of the paint going where you want it to go. I think that's all experience-based. Okay. And not having a bent needle. And not having a bent... Yeah, if you want the old the old swoopy swoopy shot, you're going to hit something around the corner. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or, little, bend, or bending bullets little here. Little bendy, why don't you... Why don't you yeah. On that puppy. So yeah, John's at home with a gun in his hand. That's what I learned from that. Yeah. Fucking American murderer. No. Uh, so uh, what I will say about a pistol grip airbrush... Is that it, it gives you, it teaches you best practices. And I said this in my airbrushing video. Every single time you use an airbrush, you want to like buffer the paint coming out with air. Mm-hmm. So the beginning and the end should be air. And the way that this is designed is it forces you to do that. You start with air, paint comes out, you let the trigger go, you end with air. So mm-hmm. it's just like, it's just, it's best practices built in. You can't avoid it. It happens right. anyway. Right. So yeah, I've never had one though. And this is this one has the different types of tips um, for it, and they're magnetized, so you just the tip just pops right in. That's pretty cool. And I did I have been hearing people saying like, well, this is not a true dual action airbrush. Well, technically, you're right. It is technically not a dual action airbrush. However, the way ninety nine point eight percent of us use an airbrush, they. They don't work that way anyway, or we don't use them that way anyway. To have the, when you're pull back on the air and you push down, what we're saying by dual action is that you, if you're pushing down to let the paint out, you're saying that what you do is you push it down one eighth of the distance it can go to do less or yeah. one half or all the way down. Realize that's like six millimeters is how far that whole thing can go down. Not even from, six. From like not on at all to all the way down it's probably like three millimeters yeah it is such a short distance to travel that the idea of being fully ripping on paint and pushing this down like a millimeter it's just like i don't know if you have incredible mortal control i feel like i have pretty good moral control because i paint miniatures you paint miniatures i can't do that i can't push this thing down one millimeter while having it fully tilted back so this might as well be a single action airbrush is what we're saying yeah the travel is so tiny this is the hpbh um, that it's like, it's not really dual action. Yeah. I mean, it now compare that to when you first pull this trigger, it lets a little bit of, of, bond of, of paint out and then you pull it all the way back and let a lot of paint out. Now feel how much more control you have over that trigger to, if you wanted it all the way open or just a little bit open, I feel like you have more control there. 
for paint for I, paint yeah i feel like the degree of rotation is definitely bigger than on a trigger yeah that's dual action right the, the trigger might rotate nine eight ten degrees this is rotating like 12 13 14 15 degrees so it's like because there is more rotation you have more granularity you have more uh, ability now does that effectively make it better at controlling paint i don't know maybe no. not it's, maybe it's too small haven't right. used it can't say and the reason i got both of these was well one because squiddy's a nice guy sent me that but i i want to really try this i want to figure out i i'm not trying to say buy one i'm not trying to say don't buy one i'm saying i haven't even used it yet but from the get-go, I don't want to be dismissive or I don't want to claim that it does a thing that I have no firsthand experience of knowing that it does. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's interesting to me. Yeah. And I think if it if it works as well as I as I hoped it will, I just think long term sessions that this is gonna this would be nice. Also, it prevents the the freaking cavemen that paint it with their thumb. No cavemen allowed here. You know who does that? Don't tell me Vince does that. No. I don't think Vince does it. No, he does do it. Goobs oh, does it, though. I know Goobs has got quite a grab. Goobs is over there with his, I don't know, he's using like his big old big toe or some shit. <laughs> Cranking back on that brush handle. Goobs, this, no. No, but no, I say that, though this prevents Goobs from using his thumb, but Goobs probably would do it like this. <laughs> <laughs> Use his thumb on this trigger, too. So, I don't know. Uh, maybe love you. Goobs' thumb is just more accurate than his other fingers. Yeah, maybe it's got a lot more, uh, you know, control and sensitivity than the average human thumb. Maybe he is an evolved human. Yeah. With just really great thumbs. Yeah. Maybe, like, three generations from now, Goobs' great-great-great-grandkids going to have their pointer finger, like, swapped out with a thumb. Oh, my. He's going to have a thumb as a pointer finger because it's so like hypersensitive yeah that it's evolving and then 10 generations from now all goobs children will be all thumbs yeah. <laughs> 10 thumbs 10 thumbs <laughs> all right we come from the 10 thumb tribe <laughs> 10 thumb there's the story for our narrative uh, game oh yes the 10 thumb tribe the origin of the 10 thumbs uh the one bit of news that i have is i follow a painter on instagram his name is uh danilo cartacci and he posted going to the movie theater, and he saw a movie. Jeremy Irons is in it, big actor, and his miniatures were in the goddamn movie. And they had like, they were on the big screen. This, this is a theater screen. There's a scene with him. Oh shit! The malls are right there. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool! Like this guy painted miniatures for a a Mo production, a Hollywood production. I don't know if it was Hollywood production. I asked him what the movie was, and he told me it was. Apologies, this is not in English. Napoleon nel nome dell'arte by Nexo Digital. I don't know who Nexo Digital is, but it's a movie. It's got Jeremy Irons, legit actor, and he painted models for it, and that's so cool. We'll link the. Is Instagram it like a Napoleonic? It's a historical thing for sure. A um, Napoleonic. Well, in the movie set, because I know, like way back in those days, like they had little Ten like figures yeah miniatures that they used actually to plan wars yeah that they would push them with their little little pushy sticks yeah and say this is where we're gonna attack the french yes or wherever yes so i think i think it definitely is in that that historical it, timeline right right, right. it's yeah. not like warhammer models <laughs> no, no, no. here's the space marine no, no it's historical miniatures <laughs> but still it's it's a foot in the door that's yeah. pretty freaking cool that's it a cool is. news item thank you for sharing that that's pretty you are welcome it's pretty rad Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for sticking around all the way to the end. That means the most to us. The most that we could mostly most. Yes. You stay till after the after party. And we just finished the after party and Scott took pills. So we got to wrap this up quick. What? John slipped them in my drink. Anyways, <laughs> if you like this show and you want to support it, there are many ways you can do it. You can do it for free by uh, like whitelisting our channel and, and and checking out our ads, which they're probably lame ads because there's YouTube ads. <laughs> we play them once every 30 minutes. Uh, you can also uh, tell your nerd friends about our podcast. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Google Podcasts, wherever you do that. Or you can spend your hard-earned dollars on our merch like this new coffee mug. Which uh, liquid definitely tastes better out of. It does. Even yeah. if it's paint water. Yeah. One of our shirts, John, I think has joggers on there now, right? Yeah, bro. I made some freaking sweatpants up there. <laughs> so some goody peepees destroy your tendy sweatpants. Yeah. You want to lounge this holiday season? <laughs> the, yeah. Most comfortable loungers. 
Uh, not actually sure. I never tried it before. Um, <laughs> you can also become a patron, which gets you access to extended episodes. Uh, about 30 minutes longer. We chat about models that we like from other paintings that we found in the last two weeks. Talk about techniques we've tried out, failed at, or in this case, things we want to try <laughs> <laughs> in this episode. Um, or we uh, we give feedback, not or, we also give feedback to a patron in the episode. So as a patron, you can submit models for feedback. You can also submit topics for us to discuss. This week wasn't a patron <laughs> suggestion, but we've definitely used them in the past. Thank you, John, for ruining my fucking promo with Yo. your goddamn cock. Let's cut it and start it over. All right. <laughs> That's it. We will catch you on the... <laughs>